RoboCup Soccer, The Humanoid League, Kids Side. The humanoids demonstrate some of the latest research pushing toward RoboCup's ultimate goal of defeating the human World Cup champions in the year 2050. Humanoid League, the goal is to play soccer with robots which are autonomous. In the kid size, uh, that's the toughest league in a sense because we have the most teams there. Uh, so qualification gets harder and harder every year. In the current setup for the kid size division, teams of three 30 to 60 centimeter tall robots compete to score the most goals on a six meter long field over two 10 minute halves. Each team can call a five minute break for setup or fixes. But this time, this two minutes also, uh, of course, apply to the other team. So they can also change their batteries in that time. Like the other soccer leagues, the robots are able to communicate with each other over a wireless network and also receive digital signals from a human referee. The main difference with the humanoid leagues is the imposition of additional rules, representing the limits faced by actual human soccer players. Teams built their own robots, uh, customized existing robots. Uh, they are humanoid, they look like humans, they have two legs, uh, two arms, a head. A, a robot must be able to get up in a certain time span of a, a few seconds, otherwise it will be taken out of the field. In general, for the humanoid league, uh, we're limiting the robots to uh, mechanisms and actuators that are kinematically equivalent to a human's. This uh, restriction to a human-like body plan, not only human-like uh, arms and legs, but also sensors, external sensors, makes the humanoid league also different from any many other humanoid projects. The arms and legs have to move in a way that is consistent with what a human body could do. We don't allow them to bend the hip 360, to turn the hip 360 degrees around, or to turn the head 360 degrees around. We are restricted to human-only sensors, which is basically seeing and hearing as external sensors. We don't use laser range finders to make it more easier. And, and this camera, in this case, is a 1A. It has a limited field of view to 180 degrees, like the human field of view. So we get about 30 frames per second, which must be processed. So we have an onboard processor, which is on the back of this robot. It's the only thing we can carry. We must carry all computation load. The area of the, of the foot is also limited. Uh, so this robot has about a center of height in the uh, area of the hip, like a, a human. And if, if you go higher with the center of mass, it's more difficult to balance. But then you can get a bit larger feet. The lower you don't, the smaller your feet become. So that still the balancing is really a challenge. These little guys are very easy to keep stable. It's relatively small, relatively close to the ground. As you go up in size, your power requirements go up exponentially. So if you double the size of like Darwin here, you need four times the power. As you can imagine, that becomes very great as you go up bigger. Now on the two year schedule that we are reducing the feet size to make it more challenging. And more balancing, but we are still far from the size of a three-year-old kid. The limitations are structured not just to make the competition more difficult, but also to spur innovations in artificial intelligence. So one claim actually is that we need a human-like embodiment to develop human-like uh, intelligence. The world is designed for humans. Everything's at a certain height. The doorknobs at a certain height, stair steps and width are at height designed for humans. So why try to develop a robot that has wheels or tracks and try to struggle to get it to fit a human life or modify our world for them. More than 10 years ago, the goal was for developing intelligence in machines, so the benchmark problem was playing chess. For a human to play chess is a very challenging intellectual task, but actually for a computer with a computer approach and the kind of bookkeeping that it can do and going through billions of combinations, that is, is very easy. Yet the sort of things that we take for granted as humans, turn out to be much, much harder on a computer. Now, if you would compare chess with a robot on a field, then our robots do not see the whole field, they just see parts of the field. The robot's localization is, is, is a challenge. Getting your robot in a way that wherever you place the ball on the field, your robot can, can find it, approach it and score into the goal. When people uh, see researchers, very serious, very dedicated researchers, 
spend their time working on robots that play soccer, then they often don't understand that we're really looking at the fundamental problems in artificial intelligence. If you have no uncertainty, there's no need to develop intelligence. The beautiful thing in some sense is that RoboCop did uh, pioneer this field of multiple robots acting in environments that are of great complexity and great uncertainty. The humanoid robots are, I would say, the most complex hardware and software we have in robots here. I mean, another point about limited sensing is versatility. Although our senses as humans are limited, we are extremely versatile. So in my view, intelligence and artificial intelligence is really the quest to never ever do the stupid thing. You don't really have to do the best thing all the time, but you have to make sure that you never ever really do the stupid things that our robots sometimes do. The innovations and developments of individual teams ensure progress for the entire Humanoid League. If you look at the uh, development of the Humanoid League, I mean, in 2002 when it was started first, the competition was actually standing on one leg for one minute. And it turned out that standing on one leg is much easier than walking. From this very first competition, if you see the, the progress which has been achieved in our, this is the actually the tenth year of the Humanoid League, I mean, it has been a tremendous progress. There's always great surprises about some teams that, that came up with a new uh, idea. I think one thing that we will see for the first uh, this year will be a goalkeeper that is not only able to actively jump and intercept the ball and stand up, which is something that we've been doing for the last um, six or seven years now, but also a goalkeeper that is able to pick up the ball and throw it to, a, to another player. And, and that will be quite exciting because that, that requires very fine motor control and also very good knowledge about where the other players are on the field. Indeed, we are going to progress, hopefully, along this humanoid you know, direction for a long time to come. We are going to get faster robots, taller robots, more robots. We are now playing four against four. We may get to the 11 against 11 on large fields. When you go to RoboCup, the first time you are kind of overhelmed because of the size of the many activities going on, but then you get to know teams and people from other countries with other ideas and other approaches. The large majority of teams is very open for discussion and for exchange and for assistance. So it's a very uh, open-minded atmosphere which helps to develop the technology and the methodologies. I was a member of the German speed skating team and I competed at the Olympics in 84 and 88. And so I've always enjoyed competitions, uh, especially the kind of competitions where there still is collaboration and the kind of competitions that, that bring out the best in the participants. And I feel that RoboCup is really uh, one of those rare events. But so it's a very friendly, very upbeat, everybody's very supportive of each other. And it's a very unique environment. You don't see that a lot. 